Yeah, we'll talk about the, the Brian simulator, which is the uh, simulator for neural network models. Um, so these days, the Brian simulator is mostly developed by um, Dan Goodman in Imperial College and Marcel Stimberg in my lab. Um, so a lot of current thinking in neural network dynamics is framed in uh, connectionism, the idea that uh, the function of neural networks arise for, from um, uh, interconnected networks of simple elements, where the important structural parameters are connection strength. And I will try to show you here that Classical connectionism is increasingly out of phase with uh, neural models that are used in the field. And so we need to take this into account in simulators. So just a quick histori historical recap. Connectionism comes essentially from McCulloch and Pitts, who proposed the first binary neural model where the activity of a neuron is a function of a weighted sum of the activity of presynaptic neurons. And this, in fact, so in, the, in, this, uh, in this model, you have two aspects. First, one is that you have binary units. And second, the most important aspect at, is that there is no time, basically. That is, um, there is discrete time and neural activity is described as operations on binary elements. Why is there no time in this, in this model? In fact, this is not the first neural model that you can find in the literature. In the 1930s, so maybe 15 or 10 years before McCulloch and Pitts, you could find uh, models in continuous time, very similar to those ones, but uh, dynamical systems proposed by Nikola Rachevsky. So why does the, this, why this one um, became very well known and not, and not this one? Well, the reason is that, and the motivation for uh, the introduction of this model is that by framing natural network function as operations on binary units, you could show, and that's what they did in their seminal paper, that uh, the operation of this, of a neural network, is isomorphic to calculus on logical propositions. So that was the appeal of this model. And if you make the assumption that time is not important and you're just applying operations on, on, on activities, then the most important parameters in your system are the weights parameters that correspond to each of the connections. And of course, a few parameters that correspond to the function that is applied here, in particular the threshold. Um, now, this is what, uh, and from that follows connectionism. There's the idea that neural network function is mostly determined by these structural parameters. And so learning consists in modifying those weights. Now, if you, if you look at neural models that are used nowadays in neuroscience research, they are typically dynamical systems of the hybrid type that is, that consist in a mixture of discrete events and continuous dynamics. Discrete events that correspond to what happens when a spike is received, a condition for spiking, what happens after the spike, and continuous dynamics, which is uh, what happens between spikes. So these are dynamical systems, and in particular, in those models, time is very important, is intrinsic, in fact. And this very simple observation has important implication because now structural parameters in those models are not just synaptic strengths, but everything else you have in your models. And for example, if you look at the response uh, at the presynaptic spike, so the response of a neuron to a presynaptic spike, then you have a response that is a function of time, so an entire 
a function in particular that you can characterize by the amplitude, but also by the duration and any other aspect that you, you may think of. For example, conduction delay and other things. So that implies that classical connectionism, at least in its uh, basic form, uh, does not work anymore for this kind of model. It's not just the uh, synaptic strength that are important. But what do we know about how these other parameters, which are many, are learned in a biological system? Uh, the answer, the quick answer to that is next to nothing, probably. But what we do know is that almost every element of structure in a neural system is plastic, at least is dynamic. So this is a um, illustration of a pyramidal cortical cell. And you have lots of structural elements here. Of course, you have synapses and the, the strengths, but there's also uh, dynamics, short-term dynamics in the, in the synapses. There's also the initial axonal segment here where um, the sparks are produced, and this is plastic. In fact, it can move depending on activity. There are ionic channels distributing along the dendrites, and those are, those are, those are also plastic in an activity-dependent way, etc. Um, and also the properties of those ionic channels are, are plastic. Um, so, the point is, basically every parameter in the models that we use in, in neuroscience research is plastic, but we generally don't take this into account. And the reason is we don't really know how, how it works, I mean, how those parameters change. So, as I mentioned in the, in the introduction, because we don't know a lot about uh, all these aspects, we are mostly focused on synaptic weights and learning based on activity of those weights. But what is going to emerge, I anticipate, in the future is models that take into account uh, the, uh, the plasticity of all those other non-connectionist structural parameters. So now the challenge is how do you simulate post-connectionist models? Well, the big problem that you have to face is flexibility. That is, there's a lot, there's really a lot that we don't know about, about neurons. And so it's very difficult, in fact, or perhaps even dangerous, to uh, come with you know, very standardized uh, formulations of models, because we don't really know how it's actually going to turn out. And the problem of flexibility is the main problem that we tried to face in the first version of Brian. The second problem is to simulate those flexible models in a way that is efficient. And that is the problem we tried to address in the second version of Brian. So the f I will first talk about the first problem, that is flexibility. So initially, when we started uh, Brian in 2008, our uh, focus was on designing a simulator that is uh, simple to use and flexible, that, is, that you can use to uh, simulate a model that uh, you hadn't thought of at the time when the simulator was written. The motto of of Brian is the simulator should not only save the time of processors, but also the time of scientists. Um, and so with this in mind, the design choice that we made is that models, instead of being pre-specified components, as was probably the most uh, often the case in simulators at the time, well, instead of that, we, uh, the models are defined by their mathematical equations, because this is a standard that already exists out there, uh, mathematical equations. And I will give you a, a, an example. So this is the, uh, an example of a simple neural network consisting of extatorial and inhibitory neurons that are randomly connected, integrate and fire type neuron models. And uh, you have here the three equations of the models. And this is a Brian's script that simulates the entire model and produces this output here. 
basic thing is that equations are given directly in their mathematical forms together with the units, the physical units. Parameters are also given with the physical units, so everything is explicit. Um, the bottom line is the, the model is specified uh, as close as possible to the mathematical definitions, including the threshold, which is a uh, Boolean condition, and reset, which is a series of statements. And this is true for the neuron models, but also for the synapses. And what we have for synapses, and this is uh, one example that uh, for spike timing dependent plasticity. So for synapses, you can also describe the models in their mathematical forms by giving the local synaptic variables, how they change with time. So these are dynamical equations. And what happens when you have a presynaptic spike? What happens when you have a postsynaptic spike? So this is an example that corresponds to classical additive STDP. But you can do uh, a lot of different models. Not, not everything is possible, of course. For example, heterosynaptic plasticity does not really fit this, this framework. But there is uh, quite a bit of flexibility there. All right, the second problem, and that is what we tried to face with Brian 2, is speed. So in Brian 1, there, the choice that we made was to uh, use uh, Python and to interpret the simulation, because that gave us a lot of flexibility on what could be uh, simulated, but of course at the cost of speed, because Python is an interpreted language. Um, we had a trick which was to use a vectorization, which is to apply um, operations simultaneously to uh, entire vectors, so sets of neurons. But that doesn't work so well if you want to do small networks for a long period of time, for example. So in uh, Brian 2, so it's a complete rewrite, rewrite of Brian that uh, instead of interpretation uses code generation. Uh, from the user point of view, it's basically the same. But what happens be behind the scenes is that these equations are transformed into code that is then executed on different possible targets. For example, uh, a PC or a, a GPU or some neuromorphic hardware or FPGA or even an Android smartphone. And for that, uh, Brian now transforms the equations, the entire models, into code, here or C, C code, that is automatically generated and specific of the target. So the way we do it is in two steps, and this is illustrated for neuron models. The first step is to transform the model into an abstract code. The abstract code is not specific of a target, it's just a series of instructions uh, in a language that is close to Python. A uh, series of operations that correspond to um, what should be done to numerically integrate the equations. So uh, in, the, in the script, you define the equations as I mean, the mathematical equations, and Brian combines it with the specification of the numerical integration scheme, which is also specified in a mathematical way, combines it into a series of statements. And then in the second step, this abstract code is combined with an, a namespace, which corresponds to the different types of variables, and transformed into code that is specific of the target. So this step is specific of the target. So there were two modes of running in Brian 2. One we call the runtime mode. In runtime mode, you still have the, the, the script is still partly interpreted. That is, for each object, the model that, is, uh, that corresponds to each object is turned into code, and uh, when, you, uh, when the run statement is executed, it runs the code for each object in turn. So it's uh, partly interpreted for the loop and partly um, code generated. And the standalone mode, in the standalone mode, uh, Brian takes the entire program up to the run statement, and then outputs an entire program that is then entirely executed on the target. 
So this is, of course, much faster. And you can also use it for embedded platforms, for example. So uh, Brian generates a set of, uh, of, of, uh, of files that you can see here, the set of files that are generated for the C++ target. You, this file can uh, be edited afterwards. So the future of Brian um, is basically the development of different targets for code generation. What we have currently is, is PCs for um, Python, obviously, but for also C++. We also have uh, some support for GPUs, a, pr a project, an ongoing project for Spinnaker and uh, Android smartphone. And we also want to address uh, FPGA computing. So let me just finish by thanking the main developers of Brian, who are uh, Dan Goodman, who is now a, a lecturer in Empire College, London, and Marcel Stimberg, who is a, uh, a postdoc with me in my lab in Paris. And this is the main publication on, on Brian, too. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Um, things like code gen generation for different platforms uh, is already done uh, by compiler infrastructures such as LLVM or things like that, and they also have already solved the problem of intermediate language representation. Um, do you consider such technologies um, as a kind of code generation backend? Uh, uh, do you mean if it could be a, a target? You know, no, it, to, it, it could be used to generate ah. code for the target because they already support all the targets or many of the targets that you've shown there. Um, well, I'm not sure you can simulate neural networks in this, uh, with the flexibility that we have here, though. OK. So, um, Uh, just curious, why you need to run Brian on the mobile device? Yeah, okay. Uh, so this, uh, the motivation for this, um, so currently we have just a prototype that does, that runs on Android. The motivation was to use it for embedded uh, platforms, that is uh, to put it on robots. And um, so a number of uh, scientists use uh, Android smartphones because you, you can program them, they are small, and they have a number of sensors on them. So um, they are quite useful for robotics research, basically. The relation with neuron? Other um, software systems for, for um, simulating multi-compartment neurons. Ah, multi-compartmental neurons. OK, so initially, Brian was not designed for multi-compartmental models. Uh, now it's coming. I mean, it's, uh, it's in Brian 2. You can do multi-compartmental neurons. Um, oh, yeah. So uh, as I said, initially, uh, Brian was not made for biophysical models, like uh, multi-compartmental models, but rather for networks of relatively simple phenomenological models. And for that, uh, I don't think neurons are very well suited. Not that it cannot simulate them. I mean, there are others, all the other simulators, if you spend enough time with them, can simulate uh, all, the, all the models. It's just that it will take you a lot of time to do it. And so our motivation was to design something that takes you, the scientist, very little time to build a new model. And um, so now there is a bit of multi-compartmental modeling, too, in Brian. And um, with the same idea in mind, that is, we're not trying to have all the features that Neuron has, but simply to have something that is sim simple to use, you know, easy to develop new things with. Yeah, I, I was also wondering, what about um, 
is it uh, compatible with uh, like 9ml or NeuroML or something like that? Can you? So I, as I understand it, 9ml, the 9ml syntax is very close to Brian, uh, to Brian 1 at least. Um, I don't think that's an accident. And um, so, yeah, we had uh, um, a project of uh, converting between uh, Brian specifications Model specification in 9ml, and um, and this should be relatively easy, in fact, because they are quite close, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Then we go to the.